All right, we've got a great interview for you guys today. Uh, normally, I, I claim to have a crystal ball in my predictions. In this case, we literally have crystal ball on. She was, of <laughs> course, one of the hosts of the cycle on MSNBC. She also did crystal clear uh, on, on the web for MSNBC. She's now at the 51million.com for Glamour Magazine. She also ran for Congress and was on the Young Turks back uh, when she was doing that. Crystal, welcome back to the Young Turks. It's great to hear you and see you, Jink. I am impressed that you remember that. That was a long time ago. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> I, you had a very unique run, and I and I found it really interesting. And 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 you were also on the twenty five most powerful women in the midterm elections list back in the day on Forbes. Yeah, it was a weird. It was a weird year. It must have been a low bar that year. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay, and now <laughs> Crystal's new book has a great title. Uh, I mean, right up my alley, reversing the apocalypse, hijacking the Democratic Party to save the world. Here, here, sister. Um, Thank so, you. <laughs> so um, first, you've had really interesting experience in both Democratic Party as a candidate in Virginia's first district uh, where you ran, uh, and then also on cable news. Let's start with the Democratic Party first. Uh, sure. So to the point of your title, why does it need to be hijacked? Well, I think the party has really strayed from its historic roots. Um, going back to FDR, this party's sort of bedrock foundational principle was that every person as a human right deserved a decent, dignified living, right? You deserve to be able to earn a wage to be able to support yourself and your family. Of course, we've never achieved that, we've never lived up to that, but that was always the fight, that was always what we've been working towards. And over the years, and I pinpoint the Clinton years in particular, we've gotten away from that. And we've gotten to this idea that you've got to be able to, you know, have these particular skills that work in this economy to be able to succeed. And if you don't have that, and if you don't know the right people, then you're kind of out of luck. So that leaves a lot of the country behind. I mean, one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book Jenk, is the fact that we're going through this massive economic transition right now. Most of the jobs that are being created in the country, and, and you know this, are low wage jobs. The top number three jobs are fast food worker, sales clerk, and cashier, so retail sales and cashier. Low paying jobs that not only don't provide a decent living right now, but also are in danger of being automated out of existence. So until we speak to that, and how we're gonna be able to get back to a middle class achievable living for an overwhelming majority of Americans, the Democratic Party is gonna be adrift as it is now. So why do you think the Democratic Party is not doing that right now? I think that they have been captured by Wall Street. I think they've been captured by Silicon Valley. I think they've gotten so caught up in the who can raise money game versus who has the right values and who's the right fit for their district that they've lost touch with that historic core principle. And again, I think this started, it started earlier than Clinton, but Clinton was the one who really sort of cemented this because he did have success in terms of getting reelected by moving the party away from labor, away from the working class and towards this sort of professional managerial and Wall Street class. And since we had some success there and we'd been in the wilderness for a while, we just continued to go in that direction where now, you know, we put fundraising almost before anything. If you can raise money, then that's what we look for in a candidate. And it's just insane. So it's no surprise that people across the country are looking at the party and saying, you don't have my interest at heart. You're not really focused on values. You're just focused on short termism and trying to win. Crystal, did you say this stuff on MSNBC and how was it received if you did? I did say some of this stuff on MSNBC. I very early on, um, called out when when the conventional wisdom was Hillary Clinton is a juggernaut. She's certain to win the nomination. She's certain to be our next president. Um, I went on air and said, you know, please don't run Hillary because as much as I admire you as a trailblazer and in certain respects, you are absolutely the wrong candidate for this moment. You are tied to the establishment. You've been all over the place in terms of what you stand for and people see you and they think Wall Street. And it was just exactly the wrong person to run at that time. I also knew if she jumped in the race, it would freeze the field because there isn't a whole lot of courage that comes out frequently from politicians on the Democratic side. 
and that we wouldn't have a lot of options. I was really grateful that Senator Sanders did decide to step in and provide a great alternative. But ultimately, having the backing of almost every Democratic politician and official behind her, it was just too much to, to overcome. Yeah, it drives me crazy when uh, pundits these days talk about like, oh well, Bernie Sanders lost to Hillary Clinton, so I don't know what you guys are complaining about. Obviously, she was a better <laughs> candidate. Ignoring the fact that she had more brand name recognition than any politician in history, ignoring the fact that she had more establishment figures and superdelegate votes behind her than anyone in history, and ask Bernie Sanders, who had almost no name recognition, to close a 60 point lead and then to win in that narrow time frame, either means you really suck at your job as a political pundit and don't understand politics <laughs> at all, or you're purposely misleading people like, oh, they had an equal chance, 50-50. I mean, that's preposterous, right? right? It, it is preposterous. And as you know, it took the media forever to give Bernie any sort of a shot. Um, and yeah, he came out of nowhere. I mean, you and I ha have been following him for a long time. You know, we were there together on Dylan Radigan, who was a fan of Bernie Sanders when he was somebody that was definitely not a household name. But here he built a campaign on the fly from scratch and almost overcame the entire force and backing of the Democratic establishment and universal name recognition. And now, you know, putting the past behind us, now he's the most popular politician in the country. So why would we not want to embrace his vision and his message? Because he actually got people excited. And the reason that he got people excited is because he touched on this central economic question. What does a dignified life, what does a middle class life look like for the future in this country? How are we going to make sure that we're lifting everyone up in every state and not just on the coast? And he, and you know, I love the coast lived on the coast, but we've got to have a solution that speaks to all of America and he touched on that. So why would we not want to learn from what he's saying and what he's done? And the other thing that I am trying to sound the alarm about here, there's a poll out just today essentially saying that if it happened again, Donald Trump would still beat Hillary Clinton in a rematch. That should be a wake up call. This has been the most disastrous 100 days of any presidency ever and still if we did it over again, Hillary Clinton would still lose. So unless we change course, unless we embrace a candidate who captures the imagination of American people and an economic vision that makes sense to people and speaks to their concerns, we are on track right now to lose again to Donald Trump in 2020. Yeah, Crystal, uh, you're exactly right. That same poll says that the Democratic Party now still significantly less popular than the Republican Party, which is astounding. And what's yeah. more astounding is that they still don't get it and they're never gonna wake up. The reason that they're that unpopular is because they have now taken on the mantle of the establishment. And people hate the establishment. So, I mean, look, it's a no brainer. Like you said, Bernie Sanders is the most popular politician in the country. Uh, Hillary Clinton is sitting at a 35% approval rating, which is significantly lower than Donald Trump's, which is unbelievable, right? And <laughs> yeah. but it's not just the it's not just Democratic Party; it's the media. If you ask uh, people on TV right now, I would guarantee you that 95 out of 100 of them would say, "Well, no, Hillary's wing of the party is the more pragmatic." part of the Democratic Party that knows how to win and Bernie's wing is not pragmatic and they don't know how to win. When in fact, that is the most counterfactual thing you could possibly say, given that all they've ever done is lose. These are the same Democratic establishment that lost to Donald Trump, that lost the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, 69 okay. out of 99 state legislatures. How could you okay. possibly, how could anyone possibly claim that they know how to win when all they do is lose? So that gets me to my next question, which is, okay, uh, you you were in cable <laughs> news for a while. In fact, you know, as a as a guest, etc. I I guess I've been on for a longer period of time, but as a host, you were on longer uh, at MSNBC. So what's your and and I and I have no idea where your take on it is. You and I have never talked about it before, so I'm very curious as to what your take of cable news was and your experience there. Well, you asked me before we went on air where I live now, and I live in Kentucky now. And and part of why is because I felt like I'm from Virginia originally and rural Virginia. And I felt like the longer I was in New York and the longer I was in DC, the less connected I was with the reality of what was going on in the country. And so 
I absolutely think there's a disconnect. There's a conventional wisdom. There is an assumption based on the way things happen in the past or the way that we perceive things to happen in the past that is just either was never true or certainly not the case anymore. Um, from Kentucky, I would go back and I would be on MSNBC or CNN and, and talk to the folks on the panels. And, and you know, these a lot of these are, are good folks. They're earnestly trying to do their job and, and figure out what's going on there in the world. But no one ever thought that Donald Trump could win. And ultimately, I didn't think he was gonna win either. But throughout the campaign, I could tell being here in Kentucky, being back home in Virginia, being in Ohio and in, you know, near Youngstown where I used to live, that there was some huge momentum on his side because he was at least speaking to people's concerns. Now he is a a snake oil salesman, he's a charlatan. He's totally betrayed everything decent that he said in the campaign, but he touched on something and there was simply no energy on our side and that recognition was completely lacking from the newsroom. And the idea that that Bernie Sanders could win, that recognition was never there in the newsroom. There's been a real loss of connection with what is actually going on in the country. And and I still see it now, you know, in the way that we're covering the Trump presidency and this fixation with going out and finding Trump voters who are still with him, rather than looking at the way things have shifted and the way maybe attitudes have changed. Because if we look at his approval ratings, clearly there are a lot of people who are no longer with him. Where are those stories? So um, I think there's just a, a, a total disconnect between the realities of the country and what people in New York and DC are, are perceiving from, you know, from green rooms and newsrooms. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, and that is, I think, at least half of the equation uh, that they, I mean, they haven't seen the real country in so long. And it almost, I mean, the Aaron Burnett on CNN, how dismissive she was of Occupy as her husband's a yeah. banker. And, and it's not, I'm not saying that she's a bad person. I'm not saying she's uh, biased just because her husband's a banker. I'm saying that she lives in that same bubble. And we and we've been there, and it's uh, and it is a significant bubble, and they just can't see outside of that bubble. The, I think the other half of their equation is for the MSNBC. They want nothing to do with progressives. I remember when you said the thing you said about Hillary Clinton that it was considered outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't it? I mean, MSNBC supposed was supposed to be a progressive network. Why would supporting Bernie Sanders or giving a, a warning about Hillary Clinton be outrageous? Shouldn't that be the most normal thing you ever heard on MSNBC? Well, in retrospect, it's insane because in retrospect, it's obvious what a poor candidate she was for the moment, at least to anyone who has any kind of intellectual honesty. But yeah, at the time, it was it was wild. You know, it went crazy. It went, it went all around the internet, and people were astounded that someone would say this thing. When to me, it was so obvious based on her public perception and on her past that this was the exact opposite of what the American people want. I mean, look, it's always gonna be, MSNBC is very different from Fox in this way. Fox is a political organization. They are filled with true believers. Roger Ailes was a true believer in the conservative cause. And so you were always gonna find room to, to push that narrative and to continue to push further and further to the right. MSNBC is not run by progressives. It's a small little chunk of Com, now Comcast Corporation, which is this giant behemoth. And the problem is, as you know, Jenk, with progressive media is it's very hard to really say what you want to say because you're always going to be biting the corporate hand that feeds you, right? So there is always a sense of you can only go so far um, underlying what's going on. So I, I think that's a broader challenge for progressive media, but certainly you find that at MSNBC. Ultimately, MSNBC is not a progressive organization. It is a business and there is a bottom line. And most of the executives are uncomfortable with true progressive politics. So the moment they have an excuse to move away from progressive politics and back to this more sort of conventional wisdom, centrism as represented by Joe Scarborough, et cetera, they're happy to go in that direction because that's where they're more comfortable to start with. Yep, now let's go to your book, back to your book. So you explained why you have to hijack the Democratic Party. Let's talk about why you think there's an apocalypse coming because that's strong language. Yeah, well, I think the election of Donald Trump represented a sort of political apocalypse that I'm hoping we can reverse and survive. Just not even putting the policy aside, which is bad enough, but in terms of our democratic institutions and 
surviving in terms of the country that we recognize as America. I think that was a political apocalypse. And then I dig into what I call an economic apocalypse, which is as I was just mentioning, we've gone through this massive economic shift already where the middle class has been hollowed out. The most common jobs in the country are low wage jobs and those jobs are in danger of being automated out of existence. So you see headlines now all the time about how Amazon is basically killing brick and mortar stores. Well, retail cashier is the number one most common job in the country. So if those stores are shuttering and people are shopping online, what is gonna replace those jobs? And no one has an answer for that right now. And so I think that is really the central question that the party has to deal with. How do we approach and how do we make sure we're handling this economic apocalypse that's coming our way? And then the other piece, Jenk, that I think is really important, and I don't want to sound too kumbaya here, but we've come to this place where every election feels like an existential struggle and where we're hurling sort of epithets at people who don't agree with us. And I can tell you here in Kentucky, there are plenty of wonderful, lovely people who voted for Trump. And there are plenty of jerks who voted for Trump and same on the other side. And I I think that we've moved into this sense that we're at war with our fellow citizens and we're losing touch with our common humanity. As people who believe in progressive politics and believe in the ability of us to come together to solve big problems, Step number one there is wanting to solve the problems of our fellow human beings, our fellow citizens of this country. Because if we are, if we're hating each other, we're certainly not going to work hard to press to pass progressive policies that are going to lift everybody up. Because we don't care about our neighbor down the street or the person in you know a state where we don't live that we're not connecting with. So I think that's the other piece of the apocalypse that we really have to have to deal with and address as people who want to come together and pass big progressive bold ideas that are going to move the country forward and provide a sort of economic framework that works for everyone. Totally agreed. It's it's not Republicans versus Democrats, it's them versus us. And uh, and you're not going to hear that often on TV because the guys in the with the big TV contracts oftentimes are part of that same establishment. That's why the Democratic yeah. Party is so unpopular. They don't. They have not been able to put together a message that they are with actual Americans who are struggling. It's such an um, amazing irony that the most popular politician in the country is a Democratic Socialist, right? <laughs> and yet the Democratic Party is deeply unpopular just because they are perceived as exactly the opposite. Which is, you know, establishment and 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 not at all populist. So um, we've allowed we've allowed anything goes on economics. You know, we've said if you're here with us on these certain um, social issues, which are important, you can do whatever you want on economics. You can be in the yes. pocket of Wall Street, you can be in the pocket of Silicon Valley, and we don't really care. And we've we've got to change that. The economics have got to be front and center because that's that's number one for most Americans out there. They want to be able to provide a de- decent living for themselves and their families. You're a hundred percent right. That's the thing that people care most about, and that's the thing the Democrats don't want to touch because of their donors. It's the most obvious mm-hmm. thing in the world. If, if yep. TV was not so blinded by being part of that same system, any punk, you know anchor worth their salt would point that out. So, Crystal, one more thing. So, how do you propose hijacking the Democratic Party? I know we've got our thought on it. JusticeDemocrats.com coming in and say no more corporate or PAC money, and and I think that that will go to a lot of what you're saying. But I'm curious as to what your yeah. thoughts on it are. Yeah, my ideas are are very much aligned with with what you're working on. Um, I'm actually working on a project with um, Congressman Tim Ryan out of Youngstown who challenged Nancy Pelosi for minority leader um, to back regular Americans. People who are working minimum wage, nurses, teachers, um, firefighters, folks out of the labor community in tough districts throughout the industrial Midwest and Appalachia. Because what we need to do is is make sure that we are running candidates who are connected to that economic struggle and feel it viscerally for themselves and for their family members. So I'm working on that project, it's called the People's House Project, to back ordinary Americans running for office, make sure that they have um, what they need in terms of being able to take a salary from their campaign so that they can actually afford to run for office. And I think that will start to A, 
transform the center of gravity in the party in terms of economic policy, if you have people who have a visceral understanding of how important that piece is. And B, I think it will start to transform the brand of the party. If you have folks out there who are speaking the language, who have walked the walk, who connect with the experience of average folks in their district. So um, I think it's very much in line with, with what you're up to there, Jank. So Crystal, one last thing, uh, you ran for Congress. When you did, I'm curious what your uh, perspective there was. How much did the party ask about your policy positions and whether they match with the district uh, as opposed to how much they asked about money and how much money you could raise? I, I really, I genuinely have no idea uh, what happened in your case and I'm, that's why I'm yeah. curious about it. Well, I mean, keep in mind, my district was a very uphill battle in a very bad year. I ran in 2010 in one of the yeah. most conservative districts in Virginia. So mostly the party just left me alone. Um, that was kind of the best thing they did, but it was always the concern first and foremost. And I was 28 years old when I was running. I didn't have a big network. I didn't really have any network at all to speak of was, well, how are you gonna raise the money? How are you gonna raise the money? And I remember at the beginning of my campaign, I had this idea, you know, I wanna cap the amount people can give me at $100, right? If people can only give $100, they're only, you know, I'm only gonna be that much on the hook for them later. And it just creates the sense of transparency that no one is going to have bought me. And this idea was basically ridiculed by anyone who knew better, right, within the party or who had been through this before. And now you just see how much more power there is in grassroots fundraising and how much how much that idea resonates across the country. If you're a candidate worth your salt, you ought to be able to raise money like Bernie Sanders did, $27 at a time and have a large number invested in, in you um, rather than just courting high dollar donors at fancy fundraisers in New York and, and San Francisco. So no, it was definitely money first. That was the measure of the candidate. How are you gonna do in your in your first quarter? Are you gonna post $100,000 at least? Then we'll see you as serious. Um, no one in the party certainly cared ever about what I was saying on policy. To the extent that they cared, they wanted me to be more conservative because they thought that was a better match for my district. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, also, that's what you want to hear, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But uh, unsurprising, but still depressing. Um, okay, so everybody, check out Crystal's book. It's called "Reversing the Apocalypse: Hijacking the Democratic Party to Save the World." We'll have a link for it uh, in the description box wherever you're watching this interview. Uh, Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. A very informative perspective on both the media and politics. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to catch up with you, Jink. Yep. Young Turks members get to watch every single interview live as it happens. TYTnetwork.com slash join.